Welcome to Walk by Faith, Navigating Life, Lessons, and Love After Abuse. I am your host, Dr. Whitlock, and you're now part of a community where inspiration is found and healing begins. So get ready, get ready. It's time to walk by faith. Hello, hello, hello. I am Dr. Whitlock and you are listening to Walk by Faith, Life Lessons and Love After Abuse. And so this is our ministry moment. And you already know I get excited when it comes to the ministry moment because God is always, always speaking to us through his word. And so welcome or welcome back to this channel. If you have not subscribed, please do so. Hit that notification button, that like, and let's get some comments going also, but let me say this, the Holy Spirit has led me to the book of Mark, and I'm not sure why whenever the Spirit leads us someplace, we eventually get revelation, and I believe it's coming. I'm getting some revelation that I wanted to but share with book you is where the God has led me to do some studying, and in this season, I'm really trying to pay close attention to the Holy Spirit and be able to move forward. Um, and, and listen to God's voice and what God is saying to me um, in this season. And so again, I am Reverend Dr. Sabrina Woodlock. Welcome or welcome back to this channel. This is Walk by Faith, Life Lessons and Love After Abuse. I want to read chapter two. And there's some really good nuggets in here, y'all. I'm telling you, there's some good nuggets in here. But I'm going to just read chapter two, a couple of verses of chapter two. And that's kind of going to be our kind of foundational scripture. But I'm going to also talk about some, you know, historical information and how to make it relevant to today. And so chapter two from the book of Mark, let me just say this. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's called the Synoptic Gospels. And we know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John talk about the life and the um, ministry of Jesus Christ. Mark, however, unlike the other three Gospels, is very short. Mark has 16 chapters. Matthew has 28 chapters. Luke has 24. John has 21. And Mark has 16. Why? Because Mark gets right down to the nitty gritty. Mark is, doesn't seem to be too concerned with what Jesus said versus what he did did. And so that's why it's really a condensed version of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. It's going to be found in the book of Mark. And so I want to read to you just one foundational scripture, and then we're going to go ahead and talk about some things. And it's found in chapter two. It says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. So what I want to talk about first is that in the book of Mark, we see that we're going to see that things move rather quickly. One, it's 16 chapters versus the others that have 28, 24, and 21 chapters. We want to see that the episodes that Jesus did, his healing, his ministry, all of that is going to move rather quickly in the book of Mark. And so by the end of the first chapter, which I didn't read, he's gone from being just one of the people in a crowd to being highly sought after. Can you imagine just just and, and this is what I was saying to someone earlier today. Just imagine that Jesus comes into town and he goes and he visits John and he's baptized and then he begins to preach and teach in the area. And the Bible says that he spoke with authority. Come on, let me let me stop right there, because whenever you speak with authority, people do not like that. Why? why <laughs> it, it just amazes me whenever you speak with some sort of authority with this, with some sort of intellect like you know a little something something people some people are furious behind that I have some examples that I can really honestly share with you that on yesterday I was involved in a meeting of sorts 
where we were discussing my health condition. And many of you already know that I was in an accident, in a car accident, where I was hit from behind a few years ago. Um, the person was not paying attention to that the, that the traffic had stopped, smashed into me from behind, and I, as a result, have a lasting injury, a traumatic brain injury. Doesn't look like it, but I do. And so I'm in this meeting of sorts yesterday and explaining my health condition because my health condition has impaired some things in my life. My life is different now. That's what it is. And because I spoke with authority about who I am, what happened to me, and with some intellect, I was told by a person that has never met me in a day in his life that I was a sham. That what was happening, what I was talking about in terms of my illness was a sham. And I said to him, you ought to be ashamed because what you're saying is very unfair. Naturally, it didn't go over well because he continued to try to over talk me as I was trying to make a point. But there was no reason whenever you just like Jesus, when Jesus came into town and spoke with some authority Immediately, they wanted to have him killed because they didn't like the way that this new person in town was operating. But that's neither here nor there. And I kind of kind of got off of the actual text, but it was just relevant because it speaks to the fact that people, some people just don't like it when you show up with confidence. They don't like it. They want you to acquiesce to who they think they are, whether they think they have power. Little do they know that all power comes from God. And if you don't, if, if you have any sort of power that God has blessed you with just as fast as God gave it to you, God can take it away. And so you have done nothing, meaning you, on your own accord. Anything that you have, receive, or will ever get will always be by the grace and mercy of our Father in heaven. And so the text, let's get back to Mark. So by the time we reach chapter 2, Jesus has come into town. He goes over to see John the Baptist. He has called a couple of his disciples. He has cast out some evil spirits. He has healed a lot of sick people. And now we get to chapter 2, and people are coming to Jesus in droves. They're coming. They're coming because they're hearing, right, that he is healing the sick and casting out demons. Naturally, folks are going to come. And I, we always talk about the crowd. I look at the crowd, too. I want you to look at the crowd because not everybody that's in the crowd is there to see you do well. N not everyone that comes around that is in your crowd is there to see you elevate. There are some people in a crowd that want to take you out. There are some people in the crowd who really needs the gifts that you have. And there are other people in the crowd that just are going to sit back and watch to see what happens. Who are you in the crowd? Ask yourself. And so they were coming to Jesus. By the time we get to chapter 2 in the book of Mark, they were coming to Jesus from all over the place, right? And the Bible says that it was so crowded in, in and outside of the house that four men who were carrying their friend on a mat had to go up to the roof and move the things out of the way and lower him down. So I began thinking, what does this house look like? Because it doesn't look like what I live in. It doesn't look like what you live in. And what I learned is that then in those time periods, there were steps on the side that allowed you to walk up the side of the house and then go to the roof. Obviously, it was a roof that was made with with whatever it was made with that you can take apart. And obviously it wasn't too high because they lowered him down to Jesus. And so what I appreciate and want to highlight about this particular text is that Jesus looked at the four friends. Come on now. Looked at the four friends and saw their faith and told the man that your sins are forgiven. Oh, it upset the Pharisees, which are the religious leaders of that day, because 
who Jesus think he is? Only God can forgive sins, right? But let me step back a second because this is important. This is an important point that I do not want you to miss. I don't know about you, but I want to have some friends in my life that when I'm on the down and out, that Jesus looks at their faith and blesses me. You understand what I'm saying? Far too many times we have friends in our lives that can't get us out of a wet paper bag if it was raining outside. Come on. So I want friends in my life who's going to carry me when I cannot walk, who's going to take me and lay me at the foot of God when I cannot get there myself. And God is going to look at the faith of my friends because they're going to push through the crowd. And if they can't go through the front there, they're going to find a way to get to Jesus to say, here's my friend. And he's going to look at them and say, your sins are forgiven. Why did he say your sins are forgiven? Instead of first, you're healed because Jesus was speaking to his most important need. And that was a forgiveness of sins. And so once Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, all that got the people up in arms, the Pharisees. Who does he think he is? Blasphemy, they accused him of, which is ultimately what they accused him of when they handed him over to the Romans to be sentenced to death. And so this is Mark chapter 2. And I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but by the time you get to Mark 3, they had already made a plan in their mind to have him killed. So it took three chapters. It took three chapters before the people saw somebody coming in town, healing folks, casting out demons. What was wrong with that? Because it, he wasn't doing it with their permission because he had the permission of God. And people who think they have power and control and want to control everything don't like it when you step up and speak with authority. But that doesn't negate your obligation to help people in their time of need. It doesn't negate your obligation, your biblical obligation, to help people to carry their burdens. That's what we are called to do. And so the four friends in this book of Mark, chapter 2, was carrying the burdens of their friend. And so I'm at a point in my life, and I don't know about you, but if I don't have friends in my life or around me that can take me to the cross when I can't get myself there, I don't need you. I don't. That's where I'm at today. And so there's a lot more I wanted to talk about in this particular text because I had even written down some notes. But it's just, doesn't it baffle you when people try to do good in this world? There's a couple of things that happen. People come along and they want to do good. And it's the evilness that's in the world that we know. The Bible says that Satan goes to and fro, seeking whom he can devour. And that means just like God doesn't sleep, you best believe Satan doesn't sleep. And if he's going to and fro, yeah, he's looking. And so you have people that come into the world, that come into your life, that want to do good, that wants to make a difference in the world. But just as many people you do have that don't want to see the world change. And so they didn't want to see Jesus coming in and the people now respecting Jesus' authority. Even though they didn't really know who he was. So when they were moving over towards Jesus to look for his help, that meant the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of that time, we're like, uh-uh, we have our vision for how God wants this world to work, and we don't know who this is. As a matter of fact, who is he? So instead of trying to get to know who he was, 
because he came in speaking with authority. Healing, which is what the Pharisees probably couldn't do. Teaching and preaching. Oh, they were upset. And by the time they got to, by the time they got to chapter three in this book, they had already started thinking about ways that they can trap him to be able to have him executed. So some of the things that I wrote down that I wanted to kind of highlight, because just like Jesus generated healing and new life, he generated an equal conflict and opposition. You're going to do that too. Just as much as I come out to do good, there are going to be people that's not going to like what I do or what I say and then try to interfere with that. Same goes for you. So if, if, if it happened to Jesus, you can best believe it's going to happen to us. He did not say that we would not have any troubles in this world. He said that he would be with us through the troubles. So we have to ask ourselves, what is all the fuss about? What is all the fuss about? We live in a fallen state. And it's almost as if there are people around us that don't, that are so complacent that don't want to see change. You got four friends that took this man to Jesus, who the Bible just says that he was paralyzed. And because they believe, they believe that Jesus could make a difference. Within two chapters, <laughs> within two chapters, they had already heard about this Jesus. And so the whole town was going. And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven because one, he met his greatest need. We all have a need for our sins to be forgiven. And then once he spoke to his greatest need, and then he told him to pick up his mat and walk. Isn't that what we should be doing? We should be helping people to have their needs met. But instead, we pull out our cell phones and we watch a man put his hands on a woman and we and we record that and we don't intervene. Or we watch a woman slap a man in his face or throw a drink in his face and we record that and we put it on the Internet because we think it's funny. Or we'll gather at a bus stop after school to see a, a group of girls fighting, hoping somebody's wig gets snatched off or somebody's shirt get torn so we can record that and put it on the internet instead of doing what we know we're supposed to do. Because when the Bible says that justice rolled down like a river, that means we are to be the ones that are bringing forth justice instead of being complacent and not even being complacent, contributing to, I would say, the injustices of the world. And so I am Dr. Whitlock, and this was a ministry moment, and I tell you, thank you, Jesus. I'm hoping that you receive something out of this ministry moment and continue to read the book of Mark, the 16 chapters. I know you will find something in there that will be relevant for you, but I just found it just so amazing that it didn't take long for the leaders and those who felt like they held power to look at somebody who was new in town to say, we don't like you. We don't want you here. As a matter of fact, we're going to have to erase you off of the face of the earth. And if they did it to Jesus, you can best believe that they're going to do it to you and I. But that won't deter us because we know who's on our side. Because if God is with us, then who can be against us? I am Dr. Whitlock, and until we meet again, like, comment, share. Let's build community. Have a good day.